Welcome to this event for those running to be the next mayor of the city of Albany. My name is Mary Berry. 
I am a member of the League of Women Voters of Albany County. Tonight's event is being co-sponsored by the League, the Council of Albany Neighborhood Associations, and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the Albany Chapter. The League is a nonpartisan volunteer citizen organization that promotes the informed and active participation of citizens in government and works to increase understanding of major public policy issues. The League neither supports nor opposes candidates or political parties. The League has a long tradition, over 100 years, of sponsoring candidate events to aid in educating the electorate so that on election day, voters will be able to make informed decisions at the polls. This event is an example of our work. For more information about the voting process and about candidates running the June in the June 22nd primaries, go to our voter information website, vote411.org. If you live in a district that is holding a primary, type in your address and the information will appear. Other places to receive information on voting are the Albany County and the New York State Boards of Elections websites. Thank you for watching our event. Good evening. My name is Deborah Brown Johnson, and I'm the president of the Albany branch of the NAACP. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's um, forum for mayoral candidates. I thank the um, League for Women Voters and Canaan for joining us in this collaboration. We believe information is power. We hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for joining us. My name is Zachary Simpson, Chairman of the Council of Albany Neighborhood Associations, also known as CANA. CANA is a citywide nonpartisan federation of neighborhood associations and community organizations that is involved in all matters that affects the quality of life of its constituents. CANA's mission is what is good for Albany's neighborhoods is good for the vitality, well-being, and growth of the entire community. Throughout the years, CANA has encouraged residents in the city to form new associations and community groups to tackle problems in their neighborhoods. Recently, Cana has been instrumental in helping neighborhoods get back together and function during the height of COVID-19. This year marks the 45th anniversary of Cana's founding, and we are pleased to continue its longstanding traditions of collaborating with the League of Women Voters of Albany County, as well as other organizations, such as the Albany chapter of the NAACP and these are very extremely important forums. I would like to sincerely thank the candidates uh, for their participation this evening. And it is now my esteemed privilege to introduce our moderator for tonight's forum, Ms. Susan Arbetter of Spectrum News. Thank you very much, Zachary. And uh, I hope you guys can hear me. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, uh, Deborah. Uh, have to speak. And um, can you guys see me now? Yes. Hear me and see me? Beautiful. All right. So thank you, Zachary. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Mary. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. My name is Susan Arbetter. I am the host of Capital Tonight on a Spectrum News. And I want to say good evening to everyone and welcome to uh, the 2021 Meet the Candidates Night for those running for mayor of the city of Albany. Um, again, this league, this, uh, this event is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Albany County the NAACP and CANA, the, the Council of Albany Neighborhood Associations. It is my pleasure to uh, welcome all three candidates tonight, Mayor Kathy Sheehan, the Reverend Valerie Faust, and Ms. Alicia Purdy. 
and we're going to hear from each of them in just a moment. It's important to note that Mayor Sheehan and the Reverend Faust will be competing in the June 22nd Democratic primary. Republican Alicia Purdy does not have an opponent and therefore does not have a primary and she will not be on the ballot in June. That said, she will be on the Republican uh, line in November as a candidate. Briefly, I wanna take a few minutes to review tonight's program and our ground rules. Each candidate will have the opportunity to make both an opening and closing statement and respond to questions developed by the event's co-sponsors. We will also ask questions that have been sent in advance via the web form 2021 mayoral questions. All the candidates' statements and answers will be time limited. Two minutes for the opening statement, a minute and a half for answers and one minute for the closing statements. Our timekeeper is Britt Westergaard and she will be in full view of the candidates and warn each candidate when their time is running out. In the interest of time, if there are multiple questions asking um, basically the same question, we are going to read one of the questions and allow the candidates to respond. So even if you don't hear your exact question read during the forum, that doesn't mean we didn't get it, we did. The candidates will be addressing as many topics as we can get into in the time allotted. And this uh, forum lasts until 8 p.m. In addition, we received questions from high school students around the region, and uh, we have embedded their questions into um, our scripting for this program, and I'll make sure that I point those out when we come to them. Now we're ready to begin, and uh, our opening statements, um, we, we, we shuffled cards, and, and the candidates are going to be talking in this order. Alicia Purdy for two minutes, then Kathy Sheehan for two minutes, and then the Reverend Valerie Faust for two minutes. So Alicia Purdy, um, over to you. All right, thank you, Susan, for uh, the time. Everybody, I'm really excited to be here as part of the Mayoral Forum. So my name is Alicia Purdy. I'm a journalist. That's what I do in my day job. I currently work as a news producer for a small, a local um, faith-based radio station out of Cohoes. And I just produce a news magazine right now. It's called The Matter at Hand. My master's degree is in journalism. And over the course of my career, um, I've done politics, government, and investment in finance. And so um, I'm running for mayor in Albany in the 2021 election, because I think that we're ready to see a transformation. And I'm very excited to present some platforms and ideas that I think um, are going to bring a sense of common sense back to the way that the city of Albany is run. And so um, at the end of the day, I really want to make sure that we factor in the human equation into the city of Albany once again. When we're um, talking about the problems, we, we are all seeing a lot of the same problems. And even though we have different solutions to those problems, um, it's important that we have uh, the theater of discourse. We have uh, opinion. We have diversity in how we think and perceive um, and how we tackle these problems that, that plague us all. And so when we, we touch these heavy issues tonight, I just want to remember, uh, remind everybody that um, we're a panel of human beings here and we all um, have a heart to see our city um, thrive and improve and grow. And at the end of the day, I'm very happy to um, be part of something in the city of Albany where um, a leadership role is presented that really I think is going to make a difference. And at the, um, the conclusion of this. I'm happy to be um, part of anything else going forward. If anyone would like to have me come speak, etc. I'm very accessible that way. And I'm, I will talk to to anybody, really. I think that my platform as the people's mayor um, is the the people's equation back in the city of Albany, having a focus of um, common sense politics and how a city is led, not so much taking the um, I just want to check my time here. Uh, not so much taking the um, the policy heavy approach, but I really want to take the people approach. So thank you very much for your time, everybody. Thank you very much, Alicia. Now we're going to hear two minutes from the incumbent mayor, Kathy Sheehan. Thank you so much, Susan. And I want to thank the Albany chapter of the NAACP and Cana and the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum tonight. Earlier today, we raised the pride flags at City Hall. Happy Pride Month, everyone. And after that event, I had a conversation with a community leader who shared with me a number of losses that she's experienced just over the last six months. And as we discussed those uh, in person, I realized that 
this is someone who in the ordinary course of a year, I would see dozens of times, but because of the COVID pandemic, I hadn't been in the same room with her in over a year. And so for many of us, the, the experiences that we've had over this past year have been made all the more worse because we haven't had access to many of the support systems that we've come to rely on. The pandemic has impacted our relationships, our trusted institutions like our churches and our schools. Uh, it's also laid bare the undeniable impacts of structural racism on our community and on our country. And it can make people feel hopeless and helpless. But as we come out of this once in a century pandemic, there is much reason to hope. First of all, social justice and equity have now become the cornerstone of building back better. And thanks to the American Rescue Plan, which I lobbied and fought very hard for, we have unprecedented resources available to us to help our families, our businesses, and our community. And as we reopen, we have the opportunity to re-engage with one another and listen to one another as we reimagine our city moving forward. And so I look forward to hearing the questions tonight, talking about my track record and building on my experience, building on my, my servant leadership, my commitment to equity and my proven track record as we lead forward over these next four years. Thank you. Thank you. And now our last um, candidate is the Reverend Valerie Faust. Two minutes from you, Valerie, thank you. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Beautiful. All right. Um, I'm pleased to be here tonight and I thank you guys for putting it on. I'm glad to be here with the other candidates and I am running because I felt that there was a need for a change in the city. I felt that um, the city was feeling uh, very sad. We were under heavy pressure of depression and, and, and loneliness and a whole lot of negative emotions that uh, just permeated the, the city, the whole city. And I felt that a change needed to come, that people needed to be uh, brought together. So one of the reasons why I am running is because I want to be a bridge builder. I see that this city is so divided and so scattered. And I think that relationships have to be rebuilt, relationships between the community and the policemen, uh, the people in City Hall, um, just across the board, uh, employees with employers. Uh, so I am in the race to try to bring a change, wanting to bring a change to the city and to do something different. We need new ideas, we need in innovation, we need uh, another uh, direction. Albany is the capital uh, city and of the greatest uh, state in the world. And we need to bring this city back up and bring more people back to the city who wanting to come back to the city uh, to get safety in the city, to get a budget that's community built that will help um, the people in the community. So I'm in the race to bring changes. We need change, that, that's my mantra. We need change, it's time for change. And that's what I wanna do with the people of this city who also feel the same way I feel and know so many places and so many areas, so many needs and so many things we need to Thank change. You. That was the Reverend Valerie Faust. Thank you so much for that. So we've met our three candidates. Now we're gonna to go to our questions. The questions are grouped by topic. Uh, crime and policing, neighborhood reinvestment and housing, uh, priorities, the pandemic, some local issues, some environmental issues, education and leadership. We're gonna start with um, Alicia Purdy. One of Sunday's Times Union's headlines, one of the headlines in Sunday's Times Union, how about that, um, was how can Albany put a stop to the gun deaths plaguing the capital city? Could you respond to that, please? Absolutely. So one of the concerns that I have, and, and this is a, is this a 90 second question? Just so Yes, it is. You will, you'll each have 90 seconds to respond to this. Okay. So um, 
yes, we are having deaths by gun violence. We actually, the homicides in Albany um, over the last five years, up 218%. Um, and that's a very shocking number. Attacking gun violence is going to be a multifaceted answer. You're going to hear that from all of us mm -hmm. um, because it does involve addressing communities. It does. It does involve building trust between communities and police. How are you going to reduce gun violence? I don't agree that anything has to do with guns themselves, because certainly if I bought an illegal gun to take care of myself, I would not indiscriminately shoot it into the street. So it's not really the guns problem per se. We have a problem and it's not poverty. Poor, plenty of poor people don't indiscriminately shoot guns in the street either. We do have a problem with our youth. We do have a problem in our communities with secrecy, a lack of trust. Well, there is building that has to be done. And you know what? This is going to take time to evolve where people are doing their part who care about rebuilding the city of Albany. So we can't just say that we care and then do nothing. And certainly you can't legislate people's hearts. So at the end of the day, what we're going to have to do is find a solution that involves the community stepping up, at the police stepping up, the policies changing to accommodate people who are um, struggling on different, maybe they have mental health challenges, whatever that is. The multifaceted approach, though, in, does not involve um, whipping guns off the street as much as it does addressing the people. Thank you, Alicia. We're going to, same question to uh, Kathy Sheehan now. Thank you. And we do have unprecedented gun violence happening in our community and in communities across the country. And we do have to do something about the proliferation of illegal guns that is plaguing communities here in Albany and, as I said, all across the country. We know what works with respect to engaging the community. We know that the, uh, the GVI program that we have in the city of Albany, where we focus on people who are at risk of either using a gun or being a victim of gun crime, uh, we know that those programs work. We also know that when we focus on the, um, the, the programs that we have in the city, our incredibly successful summer youth employment program, um, the West Hill Community Center that we're engaging in, bringing community back together, that also works. And we also know that there are many, many unmet needs that are out there in the community. And so we have to take a different view. Uh, yes, we want to ensure that we have law enforcement on our streets, but we also need to ensure that we're looking creatively at what it really means to do outreach in the city. And that outreach doesn't have to be necessarily by a beat officer. And so we're working with community-based organizations to create uh, community outreach workers who will work within our community, connecting people to the rich services, the rich programming that we do have in this city, but far too many people uh, are still disconnected from that, aren't aware of it, aren't aware of the opportunities that exist. We have hard work ahead of us engaging the community, but we also need to be honest about the fact that we have to get these illegal guns off the streets and we have Thank to you. stop them flowing into our community. Thank you very much, um, Kathy Sheehan. Now a minute and a half to the Reverend Valerie Faust. Um, I, when I read that headline, it, it, it added a more, uh, another crack to my heart because um, it's not getting better. So some of the things that I would like to do to try to, with the community, to slow that, the, 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 get these guns out of the hands of, of our uh, perpetrators, number one, the gun buyback didn't work. Uh, Snug wasn't working. Some other programs wasn't working. Um, the past two years, we had increased. So you have to get to the youth. You have to get to the families with the talk. We have to have the community together, the police, the, the uh, politicians, the churches, because when you talk about somebody's issue and you don't include them in it, it's like trying to fix them without their input. So we need to bring people in who are experiencing these crimes, bring people in who are doing these crimes um, and uh, bring our youth into better programs that work. Uh, Kathy was talking about programs that work, uh, but yet the gun violence has gone up. So change, we need to go back to the table and do things that will work. New things, different things, innovative things, progressive things that include all of us. It won't, it's no panacea and it won't happen overnight. But if we start dealing with our youth, get them early in school, get them early, uh, um, even as early as daycare, we could get Thank them. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Valerie Faust. 
the the next question, the the first um, uh, politician is you, Valerie. We're going to ask you this question first, okay? Please comment on the results of the Albany Police Reform and Reinvention Collaborative and what you think should happen next. Well, I don't think it has been very successful um, because uh, it, it, I don't think it's been transparent enough. A lot of people still don't know about it. I think that it is following a lot of the same steps and uh, thinking processes of old. And so um, I think we need it and we should do it, but I think that we need fresh minds, fresh ideas. We need to um, rethink things that we have been going over before it we just need newness and when you're trying to put this there's, there's something that says you can't put um new wine in old wine skins because it'll bust you can't put old information out to solve new problems that are worse and that are not getting better so yeah i'm for it but i think that it should be restructured you're saying that the, the actual police reform and reinvention collaborative should be restructured, Valerie? And to some extent, yes. Okay, you have 30 seconds. How would you restructure it? Well, I think that it, it to get the, first of all, to get the right people there at the table, to get uh, transparency there, to get um, people, uh, new minds there with, with uh, forward thinking at the table so that it is it's more effective in that sense. Got it. Okay, so uh, next up to Alicia Purdy, uh, same question. Um, the results of the comment on the results of the Albany Police Reform and Reinvention Collaborative and what you think should happen next. So the Albany Police, um, when I've spoken to them, I want to just say, first of all, that clearly what we have isn't working or there wouldn't be contenders for the office of mayor. And so the programs that, regardless of what the programs are, if it involves the police in the community, what I would like to see is a better collaboration where um, people, civilians are not coming in and they're not legislating without police direct input. And the police are completely open to this. And so when we collaborate around um, what should be done and what can't be done, it is imperative that it's represented by the families and the communities themselves. One of my concerns that I've noticed when we when we have these boards is that it, they're not an accurate representation of the diversity of thought, opinion, and experience that we have in the community of Albany across the board. They, they lean off to one side and what's happening is we have- Which, which side? I'm sorry? Which side? Um, they lean, I'll say this, they lean away from the police side. And while I have an understanding, I'm not, I'm not judging that it's wrong. And I understand why we're there. What I'm saying is we need to bring it closer to the middle because there are officers who are well-intentioned, they're human beings, whatever. My concern is that we're going to, we've broken trust with the community and there's work to be done. But I don't want to also break the trust and demoralize our police officers and our department because their work to be done too, and they're willing to do that work. And it's important that we honor that commitment to everybody working together and having an even handed representation. Thank you, uh, Alicia Purdy. So now to Kathy Sheehan, if you could re uh, uh, respond, um, what, what do you think about the results of the Albany Police Reform and Reinvention Collaborative and what should happen next? Well, I'm really proud of the volunteers who stepped forward, participated in 64 meetings. We held 14 hours of public comment. But I also understand why people don't believe it was transparent enough. We were in the height of a pandemic. We weren't able to get in a room together and have these conversations. And so we are going to be engaging the public. We're going to be going out to parks, going out to community uh, organizations and meetings, informing people about what's in the plan, getting more input. We're, we have 27 Seven action items that are in that plan. We need to hear from the community about how they want to prioritize those items, what they want to see happen. And I'm also really proud of the fact that we had police officers participate in every single working group. I was roundly criticized for that. There were activists who didn't want there to be police officers at the table. But you can't reform healthcare without nurses. You can't reform education without teachers. And you can't reform policing without talking to the people who are doing the job. The men and women of our police department have done amazing work 
over these past 14 months. The stress and the trauma and all that they have had to deal with is something that has led to, I think, a real change in how we see one another. And I hope that we can get back to a place where we see one another as human beings who are trying to help our community. And so I, I think that we have great ideas. I'm very proud of the diversity. We o- we're overrepresented um, for, in communities with representatives from communities that are impacted by o- over policing. And so now we need to get out and tell the story. Thank you. So um, our next question also has to do with um, policing. And we're going to begin with Kathy Sheehan. What steps will you take to improve the trust between the Albany Police Department and the minority communities? You know, this has been a, an ongoing challenge, not just in the city of Albany, but across the country. When you look at the results of, uh, of surveys that have been done here in the city of Albany, they're very similar to the distrust that we that exists in the black community, understandably, um, of police and policing. It, this is about a system that was really dates its, itself back to um, our slave days. And so, uh, you know the the structural racism and the and the institutional racism that exists in policing has negatively impacted the lives of black and brown people for centuries. We have to acknowledge that. And I say to our police officers all the time, that's not me saying that you are racist, but when you put on that uniform, you are putting on what is a representative of what police officers did on that bridge in Selma, of of. It, the experiences that young black men for the, you know, mostly, they're the ones mostly impacted, although uh, black women as well, um, it, who have had interactions with the police. We know from our own survey, you know, the our own audit that the city paid for, that there is disparate in a policing that happens in the city of Albany. We have to acknowledge that. And then we have to engage in the conversation about how we change those outcomes because this is a national emergency and we have to start to change outcomes. And I think we do that by being transparent, by humanizing one another, by getting in the same room together and being honest about what has been going on. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy Sheehan. Um, The Reverend Valerie Faust, what steps will you take to improve the trust between the Albany Police Department and minority communities? Well, first of all, uh, communication. You have to communicate with each other. And so I I don't think there's enough communication. And I think that when strife starts, when people are at each other, nobody's listening. And so I think that there needs to be a coming together. There needs to be something set up where uh, the policemen and the the black community community can meet. And I think there's some apologies. I think that, that, you know, there's some healing to be done. And I think it has to be done in an honest way. I think that, you know, the policemen weren't always right. and, And the community think that in most cases they were never right. And so um, in order to get a change uh, between the black community and the policemen, there has to be communication. It it has to be a bringing together and and each side has to be open and willing to to, uh, uh, start on a new foot, to start a new, uh, fresh again. Okay, this is what happened in the past, this is what happened. We are sorry that we didn't understand you from the police department and the the black community saying, okay, well, what are we, where are we going for there? And then sit down and make some real decisions and and, uh, uh, plans that will enhance the the, uh, communication and the relationship between the, the police and the black community. It has to start with communication and honesty and sincerity. Thank you, Valerie Faust. Um, Now to Alicia Purdy, same question. Steps you will take to improve the trust between the Albany Police Department and minority communities. Well, I can tell you, first of all, starting from a a platform of critical race theory is not the way to go. I disagree that the police uniform has anything to do with the sins of the forefathers in today's modern policing. And of course, there's work to be done. And I want to state that unequivocally, that on the police side and the side of the Black communities or people of color communities, there's always work to be done. 
We can absolutely agree to that. And it is a matter of communication. We have to find a common ground and that's where we've been difficult. And you know, the one year of, of the pandemic isn't, isn't really the, a viable excuse for a lack of transparency or a lack of inability to bring people together and address some of these problems. What we have is decades worth of, of all kinds of mistrust, whether it's, it's um, cultural or, or whatever that might be. I will tell you right now, the people I talk to in the black community and the Albany police officers are completely willing. And so what we need is a mayor who was able to facilitate that from a point of neutrality, not taking sides, not saying you carry the sins of your father upon you because somebody was a, a, a slave owner. That is not representative of a common man in the city of Albany at all. That's an activist narrative and I don't believe it. I reject it completely. I am completely on the side of the people of Albany finding common ground and not focusing on what divides us and setting aside those differences and saying, okay, these are the problems. You admit you have work to do, so do you. Now let's get to work. And we need a mayor that can do that from a point of neutrality, who's really on the people's side in the city of Albany and not taking sides, because someday that side could turn against you. Thank you, Alicia. Um, our next question comes from an Albany High School student. And uh, Alicia, you're gonna be answering this first. Okay. If, you were, if you were to travel back in time, <clears throat> excuse me, to last summer, how would you have handled the Black Lives Matter protests that were happening throughout Albany? And did you feel that the actions taken were appropriate? If I could travel back in time, I would go back to before the protests started and I would have listened to the communities and the needs that they had. Now, now I, I'm just gonna take the little microcosm that happened with George Floyd. That was really what that was responding to that specific incident. But there has been a simmering anger and a failure to feel, and people don't feel listened to. They feel disregarded. They feel legislated. They feel overseen. Um, this is the problem. I would go back in time 10 years ago. I'd go back 50 years ago and I would do much much better work in the city of Albany of bringing communities together, listening to people who are hurting and crying out, and yes, still suffering in their emotions and their minds and in their economic conditions from the past. And so that's where I would go. So was the response what it should have been? Um, I, first of all, I don't agree that a riot is a way to solve problems, but I do understand why people riot. I have talked to the Black Lives Matter activists in the city of Albany, and the root cause is that nobody is listening. People show up, take their pictures, leave, use them as a backdrop, and they're tired of that. And so when I go down and I talk to them and I tell them, I am listening to you. I was there when they marched uh, several weeks ago back in April. I was physically present, and I walked along the sidewalk. I walked all the way down there. I was there during the encampment, and I said to them, has anyone from City Hall ever shown up for you? And they said, no. And I said, that's why I'm here. If I could go back in time, that's the first thing I would do is I would let them know I'm here to listen and not take sides. And we're going to find resolution because I'm a common sense and common ground person. And that is what really changes people to feel that they are validated. Thank you, Alicia. Again, this is a question from uh, an Albany High student. And uh, Kathy Sheehan, would you please answer it? If you were to travel back in time to last summer, how would you have handled the Black Lives Matter protests that were having, happening throughout Albany? And did you feel that the actions taken were appropriate? I think that that's a question that um, mayors across the country would love to be able to grapple with and discuss. You know, when the riots and the protests uh, broke out across the country, um, mayors felt uh, in many ways as though um, we were at sea because when we showed up and this wasn't just unique to Albany, it was you know my friends who are mayors in uh, Phoenix and, and Albuquerque and, and everywhere else, um, the protesters didn't want us there. Um, you know, many of us were shouted out of, of the room. They didn't want to hear from us. And so you know, what, what I think that I did was to try to create space for productive dialogue, you know, try to create the room uh, for people to protest and not uh, be seen as somehow, um, you know, interfering with that right to protest and with making those voices heard, not being seen as that politician who just showed up to get uh, a picture taken. So I did a ton of listening. And if I could go back in time, um, I would have changed how tear gas was used. I think we learned a lot from, uh, from what happened the second night that protests got violent. Uh, and I wish that I could go back in time and, and have there be a different result from that second night um, where tear gas was used in our city 
and we lost trust from the community and and it was it we caused a lot of harm and hurt thank you valerie faust same question to you uh well i think it started out as a peaceful march and um if i were there as a uh, mayor or someone with uh, some authority i would have been out there with a bullhorn uh saying let's keep it peaceful we're, we're listening, we're going to work this out. You have a right to march, you have a right to protest, but let's keep this peaceful. Talk, find out who are the leaders, who are the ones that um, are uh, making the decision, leading the crowd, um, uh, having them say, uh, go left, go right. Get to those people and talk with them and, and see if we could come up with something that can keep it peaceful because every peaceful march does not turn into a riot, you know? And so I would definitely be out there. Hey, y'all, excuse me, I'm just demonstrating. <laughs> Come on people, let's get this together. Who are the ones that I can bring in the office to talk to? Who are the ones that can keep the peace out here until I come back with the, with the leaders? Uh, and, and I would be talking to my policemen saying, okay, Keep it cool. Keep it calm. All right. We we want we don't want to agitate this situation. We want to bring them in. Uh, talk with me. Talk with the police and uh, keep it keep it as peaceful as possible. And definitely, uh, tear gas was not not the answer. So many innocent people. Um, kind of against it. Uh, uh, tear gas because it 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 doesn't stay one place. We we will definitely be getting to the tear gas issue in a minute. Um, our next question, we're going to begin with uh, Kathy Sheehan. What is your position on the Common Council's proposal to form a public safety commission to oversee the recommendations of the collaborative that we already talked about and help implement some of those recommendations? And if you support this action, what would you do as, may as the mayor to implement it in a timely manner? Well, one of the recommendations in the Policing Reform Collaborative Report is to create a third arm of public safety in the city of Albany. And so I support that. I have supported it. And I look forward to working with the council to move that forward. Uh, we have, uh, I, I believe we have the authority to do that, uh, you know, currently, um, you know. You don't under, think it's going to take a, a new law to create that commission? Absolutely not. Our city charter provides for a commissioner of public safety. And so, um, you know, we have already begun the work. We've created um, a, a, a working group within the city to look at what we need to do internally. And then we have to look at, and we're also engaging in um, a uh, what works cities collaborative so that we can understand how this has worked in other places, uh, learn from uh, you know, others' mistakes so that we don't repeat them, and uh, work together to ensure that we have an alternative to sending police officers to every issue that happens in neighborhoods in the city of Albany. And so I think that this is something that uh, we will be working together on. It's, you know, the, the, the biggest challenge, quite candidly, is finding people um, who can do this work. Uh, because this is something that's happening across the country, and it, this is a new way of looking at public safety. It's very exciting, and it's something that uh, we look forward to working on, and I look forward to implementing over the next four years. We're going to move now to um, the Reverend Faust. So same question, your position on the Common Council's proposal to form a public safety commission to oversee the recommendations of the police collaborative. Um, that may be a good idea, uh, because... In the past, so many meetings, so many collaboratives, so many uh, 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 talks at the table, so many boards. So we, we've had so many talks uh, that, and nothing comes out of them or very little. So maybe uh, having this uh, uh, new position to make sure at specifically that the, the things that they came up with, uh, the, they had so many different people on this committee, it was like, you know, uh, um, a lot of thought. So uh, yeah, yeah. If they can get uh, someone to oversee it and to uh, keep it going and to make sure that the things, ideas they came up with is followed so that we can see that this change will come to our city in, in that particular way. Just a quick question, Reverend Faust. 
Um, do you believe that a police officer should respond to loud music next door if that was happening next door to you? Or should somebody else, some other form of, uh, you know, a security person or perhaps one of these, uh, somebody from the Public Safety Commission? Well, I think if our policemen are trained and they have sensitivity training and they learn more about the black community and learn more about how to uh, de-escalate and how a uh, situation, uh, it, it's a training uh, it, that that they need, you know, police okay. reform. So I think that that uh, they could go if they go uh, intelligently the and prepared. Yeah. Uh, Alicia Purdy, same question to you. This is uh, your position on the Common Council's proposal to form a public safety commission. One of the major concerns that I have in the city of Albany with all of this reform is sending civilians in the path of potential harm. I'm completely against that in every way, shape, or form. I've talked to enough officers where, let's use the example you just said of loud music. Um, do I think a fully armed officer in Kevlar and SWAT gear needs to run in and say someone, no. Do I think noise pollution matters to neighbors? Of course. And so something we call the police, that's what we tend to do. Now, if the police officer wants to clear the scene and say, okay, this is not a situation that requires a police officer, maybe there's some ongoing training that needs to happen there. I do not absolutely advocate in no way, shape or form sending if the situations turn volatile all too often. And loud music is not an indicator of anything other than maybe someone having a good time, no problem. Sometimes it's covering up a man smacking his wife around. And I'm not using, I'm not even referring to color. I'm just saying in general, this could be, there could be loud music for any reason. And we've got to have protection for people that are going into these situations because too often they turn volatile. And I absolutely do not advocate for sending in a civilian alone, not in any way, shape or form. Now I do agree that the police should have ongoing training. In fact, if anything, I wouldn't defund, I would give them a little more funding to do something where they can understand maybe how to deescalate or they can have someone do a ride along, no problem. Like I said, and they're trained to say, okay, everything is secure. We're okay here. You can handle this. I'll be out here if you need backup. You know, if something turns, let me know. Um, but where the police officer is absolutely there and they are ready to protect should that matter uh, occur. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to our next question. And Valerie Faust, this is uh, going to you first. Um, what is your position on the use of tear gas and rubber bullets by the police on civilians? I'm against it. I'm against it. Uh, but I, I, I am also for coming up with viable uh, methods because if a crowd is out of hand and about to hurt other people or, or destroy property, there has to be a more humane method to stop them and get them back into, uh, uh, to keep them from doing more harm. But tear gas uh, makes victims of people who are not a part of the issue. Rubber bullets are as dangerous almost as a, a reg regular bullet. Oh, my, it, my camera went off for a minute. Uh, and yeah, rubber bullets have proven to be l almost as lethal as uh, the regular bullets. So we have to come up with uh, something that can control crowd, crowd control problems, but at the same time, uh, come on, let's uh, don't dehumanize the people who are out there and uh, the neighborhood and other innocent people. So no, I'm not for the tear gas and the rubber bullets, but I am for coming up with uh, sound ways, good ways, uh, you know, talking to other cities, other mayors, other places that has come up with ways to uh, de-escalate a crowd and uh, get it back to peace. Thank you, uh, Reverend Faust. We're gonna go to Alicia Purdy next. What is your position on the use of tear gas and rubber bullets by the police on civilians? So I will say this, we all remember, if we live in New York State, we all remember what happened on 9-11, okay? We were attacked from outside. The city of Albany absolutely must have the ability to protect itself in the event, unlikely, however, of any kind of insurrection. It is a responsibility, and I know that that you know, Kathy Sheen and I agree on this point because I've read her statement on it. We absolutely, I am not getting rid of tear gas. It's not gonna happen. Now, do I think we should, create different parameters by which that is used? Absolutely. Do I think that 
there needs to be some checks and balances, some warning systems in place. Sure. Now that's for the average civilian. Do I think the average person who has an opinion as, and is expressing that opinion in, in an unpopular manner should be tear gassed and sprayed with rubber bullets? Of course I do not. That's a human being issue. However, am I going to get rid of all that all that we have to protect ourselves in the event that something the unlikely should happen? And we cannot, now we cannot protect ourselves. We cannot protect our residents in our city. No, I think that would be a flagrant waste. It would be the worst kind of leadership that you can imagine that you have now laid the city of Albany bare. Talk about guns shoot, firing in the street. This is when you're going to need it. Now, tear gas is non-lethal. So in the event that it's deployed, in the event of an insurrection, for example, everybody's going to be okay, even if they're a little pissy about what happened to them. That being said, you do not want to be leaving, you don't want to leave the citizens of Albany vulnerable at all to some kind of attack. Work to do on the citizens and when it's deployed? Absolutely. Kathy Sheehan, what is your position on the use of tear gas and rubber bullets on police, uh, by police on civilians? Well, I fully support a complete ban on tear gas and rubber bullets for peaceful protests. That's not what our police officers faced. Uh, let's remember that we had Molotov cocktails thrown at our mounted police officers and at our horses. We have officers who received bricks to the head um, and a situation that grew really violent. And, you know, I, I loved uh, Val's answer about, you know, if she could turn back time. And, and I will say, um, I, I, I did not want to be the lightning rod, right? Right. Mayors were lightning rods, but I reached out to our common council members who went to those protests and who talked to people who they recognized and knew, but saw very few. There were very few people in those crowds that were violent who were from our community. And so that made it all the more challenging. And so, yes, we have to have safeguards in place. We have to earn back the trust of the community. I you know, spoke to a woman who was in tears uh, after that second night of using tear gas because it was deployed on residential streets. People who were doing nothing other than trying to put their kids to bed and their windows were open and their house filled with tear gas. So we have to do everything in our power to ensure that we uh, use uh, the utmost restraint, uh, that we have checks and balances in place, warnings in place, EMTs on site, you know, I think that we have to and we owe it to the community to do better. And that that is something that our police department is committed to. From the mm -hmm. moment we used tear gas, the police department started looking at Thank how you. we used it and said we had to do better. It has been repeatedly reported that the Albany Police Department has a shortage of personnel. How would you deal with the shortage of police officers, Alicia Purdy? So we're down, I think at last count, 90 police officers. The point now we have to call in the sheriff's department and the state troopers to come help. Um, I could sit here all day and talk about how we should hire more people and we should make sure there's more diversity. We should get them contracts. They've been without contracts since what, 2016. There's a lot of work to be done here in, in the police. I wanna attract great, it used to be, it used to be a wonderful thing, an amazing thing. People would come into the city, they'd go into these rural, rural areas, and then they'd, with the goal of coming into the Albany police force, it isn't that way anymore. And so what we need to do is not only attract talent, we need to be able to retain talent. We need to be able to respect our talent they, they're working double shifts. After they see somebody shot in the face, they don't even get a day off. They don't get a debriefing. They have no continuing legal education. These are things that make people demoralized. It makes them feel like they're betrayed by the city when they get blamed for things that happen, when they, they weren't aware of a statute or nobody filled them in. And they take a lot of the brunt. And so we have a lot of work to do with rebuilding the trust of the police as well as the community on both sides. We've got to remember that these are human beings that chose this job to protect and serve not to enslave. And at the end of the day, when we want to attract new talent, we have to give them something to be attracted to. Competitive pay, contracts, great benefits packages. We simply don't have it and we haven't had it for a long time. And the demoralization of the Albany police office has been one of our greatest travesties in, that I've seen in decades. So just to clarify, the reason you think that they have a shortage of police officers is because of morale is so low. Uh, that's one of many reasons they can't get out of the city of Albany fast enough. Yes. Um, Kathy Sheehan, same question to you. It has been repeatedly reported that the Albany Police Department has a shortage of personnel. How will you deal with that? 
This has been devastating. Um, it really is. And it's, uh, it is a challenge that exists across the country, but it's made harder in the city of Albany because an internal dispute among our police union prohibited me for the last four years from negotiating with our officers. We're still waiting for them to determine who their leadership is going to be so that we can sit down at the table and negotiate a contract. They need a raise. This is killing us. We have to be able to pay our officers competitive wages. And I am anxious to get back to the table. We're really thrilled that we were able to get to a contract with our sergeants and our lieutenants. We, 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 we have a negotiated contract. We didn't rely on an arbitrator. We were able to sit at the table together and get to a negotiated contract with our lieutenants and sergeants. We need to do the same with our officers. We are losing officers because we're not competitive and we're losing officers because we have that you, you saw what happened at the protest that, you know, Alicia was willing to go down and talk to individuals who literally called our police officers the N word, who, call, who threatened their wives, their children, who said horrible things to them. The reason I didn't go down and talk to those protesters is because I couldn't do that to our employees. Our officers did not deserve for those protesters to be legitimized after they said those horrible, awful things and treated our officers the way that they treated them. So this is, these are challenging times. It's impossible for our officers and we Thank have work to do to get back our force. So um, Reverend Faust, again, a shortage of, of police officers. How would you deal with that if you were mayor? Well, find out why that is. Uh, and I do agree that salary is part of it. I, I agree that morale is a part of it and you have to help build up the morale. And I think that when people feel unappreciated and disrespected in a job that uh, they, they're putting their lives on the line for others, that you would have to build morale and you have to do that uh, by um, increasing their salaries and, and, and giving incentives for them to stay. Not only for them to stay, but um, also in, in the middle of, I took the police uh, training course for citizens and they said they get people in but they can't keep people. They go to the state, they, they come, they get the training and then they, they uh, slip out and go to become a state police. So, you, so it's not a, uh, a problem of getting them in, it's a problem of keeping them. And then if you know this is the problem, let's find the solution so that we could stop it. And, um, and that, again, I'm, a, I'm big on communication. You have to talk, you have to sit down, you have to exchange. Uh, of uh, ideas and come up with solutions. And so I think that um, that situation can be improved. One more thing, a lot of people, quite a few people took the test and were turned, turned down. They passed the test, they, they uh, did very well uh, in the psychological. And I know of three people who were turned down after they took the test and didn't know why and didn't find out until you know, the last minute, you know, so there are a lot of situations going on. Um, this next question is um, frankly heartbreaking. It's from a student at Green Tech High School. Um, with all the violence going on, what initiatives are being placed around the summer parks to keep the park safe? As a teenager, I wanna go to the park and play baseball and hang out, but I'm scared and my parents are scared to let me go. What are you going to do to ensure that this student and others are safe this summer at the city's playgrounds and parks? We'll start with Kathy Sheehan. Well, it is a heartbreaking question and it's understandable. It's so concerning what we're seeing with the proliferation of guns in our city. But I will say this to that student, we have, uh, first of all, we've made unprecedented investments in our parks. So you're gonna have great parks to go to. And we also have are making unprecedented investments in programming in our parks. We need for there to be adults there. We need for there to be activities there. Um, under the leadership of our Commissioner of Recreation, we're having uh, our first ever citywide basketball league this summer. Um, we're going to be doing a program with girls uh, through the College of St. Rose and some leadership there. And then we're doing a program for boys. We're doing our 13 to 16 year olds and our 17 to 19 year olds. Um, across the city. And it's not just about playing basketball. There's a health component to it. And we're going to be engaging parents and other family members who come 
for this basketball league. And so, uh, you know, we're, we also have a uh, violence prevention task force that has uh, proposed a number of initiatives throughout the city. We're gonna be making a number of announcements over the next uh, couple weeks as we get closer to summer and school getting out to ensure that people know that we're doing all that we can to make those spaces safe to ensure that our children are safe. And we also have to come together as a community and look at the harm that is being caused by these guns and say to our residents, no guns in the city of Albany. Valerie Faust, same question to you. What would you do to ensure that uh, this student and others are safe at the city's playgrounds and parks this summer? Well, that's a hard one because it stems on the, the first question about the, the level of crime in the city. We know that a lot of the perpetrators don't care about life. They're, they don't care. They don't value lives. They, they shoot indiscriminately and innocent people are being killed uh, and it has increased. So what do we do about that? While we're working on the issue of uh, lowering this crime, getting guns out of their hands, and, and when you take the gun out of uh, out of their hands and the, and the drugs out of their hands, you got to put something in there. You got to give them hope. You got to give them training. You got to put them on a road to uh, to uh, uh, progressive living. Now, uh, one of the things that can be done, uh, which uh, we did years ago for the um, for one of the events that was coming up, we had the preachers come together. We had communities leagues come together. We asked them to talk to their family and friends about the, the, the thugs in their family. We asked them to really uh, um, put the word out that uh, we're, we're going to ruin our, our uh, event and not have it again if, if they show up with guns, no gangs with scarves on and all that. So there are things that can be done, but again, um, we can only try our best until we deal with the gun violence problem and the crime problem in the city. But to that young man, we will do the best we can to keep you safe, even if we do some indoor things to start with, to build, to use some of our grant money, our, our budget to build uh, uh, something you. huge and fresh that they could be in. Alicia Purdy, um, same question to you. Okay. So I, I know basketball programs are fantastic. I know that I would not want my child to be shot in the face while he's shooting hoops. And so I think one of the major things we do need where our police force is spread thin, we're all aware of that for many reasons. Um, there are there are great people in the city who are doing things for youth. And I would like, I agree with the idea of an increased adult presence in parks, adults who are employed to um, observe, to watch, adults who are mentors, possibly people who work with Albany Pal, that there are people there that are, are trained to keep an eye out for trouble. And then they can call for that backup or that help. Or we have an officer or somebody who's around, a community officer, a beat officer. I hear all the time people want their beat officer back. Um, you know, because uh, the parks are, are a wonderful thing, but I don't want, I'm a mother. I've got five children. I'm not going to a park, especially not in the evening when people start to get raucous. And so I really do agree that having adults who care, and by the way, they do exist in the city of Albany. They're underutilized and often overlooked. They do exist and they're doing good work and they would be willing to step up and help. That's the first thing. And that's my whole platform as the people's mayor is to empower people. I want my kids to be able to go to the park. I want to be able to send my kids, my older kids to the park and say, go ahead and play ball. But I am concerned if something should break out, we shouldn't just scatter and leave. We should have some kind of way that we can employ a network of information to say, here's a problem. This is happening. Because when citizens get involved in their own safety, then that's when people start to build trust because they have, they have an investment in what's going on for their, even if it's just for their children. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to uh, another uh, topic, and this is um, basically community disinvestment and how we can rebuild our neighborhoods. Valerie Faust, this question goes to you first. In the city's poorest neighborhoods, basic amenities like grocery stores and other typical neighborhood services are lacking. What can you do as mayor to strengthen the physical and functional infrastructure of these communities? Well, there's a lot of uh, boarded up buildings, closed businesses. Uh, there's a lot of property that's uh, vacant that you can utilize in, in, in the inner city that, and you can make it easier for them to utilize it. You can also help make it easier for them to get money to help uh, build a, a, um, and fix up this 
property for a supermarket, for a store, um, and not uh, put up blocks and, and um, hindrances that stop them from getting code uh, passing and stop them from getting uh, grants uh, in the inner city because we all know systemic racism, a lot of, uh, of, of our black people and people of color can't get a lot of what other races get. We seem to be at the end of the line and the money ran out. So we need to be fair and equitable with the inner city uh, um, uh, African-American and people of color. Give them the money, help them get these properties, help them give them incentives and let them build up, up, up for themselves. They can do this, we can do this, you know, and um, I think that the city budget can have uh, money allotted for uh, 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 helping in these situations. Twofold, you get rid of some of those abandoned buildings, you get rid of some of that, that those closed businesses and you get tax money in because every business helps the economy, puts it back on the tax roll, put, right. um, you know, so Thank I you. would go that way. Um, Alicia Purdy, in the city's poorest neighborhoods, basic amenities like grocery stores and other services are lacking. What would you do as mayor to strengthen the physical and functional infrastructure of these communities? Yeah, I was really upset when Walgreens per pulled out of North Pearl Street. The three Walgreens have disappeared in the city of Albany. McDonald's is gone from the South End. I mean, major corporations cannot sustain doing business in the city of Albany. What hope does a small business person have? Well, with the People's Mayor, they have a new hope because I absolutely believe in investing not only in small businesses of just of white people, but very specifically people who have a heart to serve their community. Maybe it's a bodega. Maybe it's a little store. We have somebody that's coming down to that old McDonald's um, downtown on the end of Madison Avenue. I love something like that. But my concern is that they're going to pull up stakes and leave again because of the red tape, because of the high tax burden that they have. Because when riots break out, the likelihood of them getting their windows smashed is very, very, very high. Black owned business owners were the most affected when riots broke out. And so what I would do to I would start with small businesses, I would protect and invest in small businesses. Maybe, maybe we spend one year not giving that, uh, letting them keep their sales tax. Maybe there's something we can do to get rid of some of this bureaucracy and endless committees that we have to form before somebody can get access to a program. I hear from black people, I heard a black business owner bought a building in the city of Albany. They wanted to open a salon and they weren't able to do that because they inadvertently they weren't aware with the laws they inadvertently bought a historical building and oh they couldn't open one and now their life dream went down the toilet and all their crap is in their house these are problems that people live with every single day and you cannot legislate them you have to de-legislate some of these problems to give people access especially in poorer communities where they have a dream and they can sustain themselves they want to and we need to help them kathy sheehan same question to you Look, the impact of redlining on our neighborhoods is still uh, incredibly visible today. And the, um, the, the decades and decades of disinvestment was something that I committed myself and my administration to dealing with and undoing. And it started with infrastructure. The first thing I did was looked at what we own. I wish we owned all those vacant buildings. We don't, we don't own any of the buildings that have red X's on them, but you know what? We do own the sidewalks. And in West Hill, the sidewalks were made of asphalt. And that was, uh, it, talk about a disinvestment, talk about nobody wanting to come and invest in that community. So we rebuilt our sidewalks. We replaced all of our street lights to make our streets brighter. We've launched an initiative to ensure that we're doing all that we can to make our infrastructure as beautiful in every neighborhood of our city um, and, and that we are investing with equity across our city. That's what investing in the parks was, was about. And now we are seeing the, um, the impacts of that. We've had unprecedented investment along Clinton Avenue, hundreds and hundreds of units of new housing rehabbed, West Hill, um, Sheridan Hollow. So we are seeing what happens when you make those investments and you start to undo that de those decades of disinvestment. If we want a grocery store, we need people. And so as we see investment ha happening um, in our neighborhoods, neighborhood by neighborhood, which we are seeing, um, and, and it continued even through COVID, we continue to see construction in those neighborhoods. It's hard work and I'm Thank committed you. to continuing to do it. Next question um, for Alicia Purdy first. What is your plan to increase the availability of affordable housing in the city of Albany? One of my major concerns about what's going on in the city of Albany right now is we're about to come into $86 million. 
and we have a plan to build a $13 million sky bridge in a very difficult area of town. And that some of that money, my concern is that the vague language in, in the presentation of the $86 million we're about to come into um, does not guarantee or encompass housing for people who are struggling and are unhoused. Let me tell you what, one of the things that I believe in completely in the city of Albany is going to help be part of our transformation is Black home ownership. And I really want to loosen the strings to getting people in these areas that want to invest in homes. They want to own. Statistics prove that when somebody owns a home, they take care of that home. We want to talk about helping our tax base. Well, now they pay taxes. And so there are, Albany City does actually have a lot of programs, but one of the problems is access to those programs. The transparency, it's one of my platforms I'm running on. There's there's an inaccessibility, there's a lack of transparency in how to get to these things. And, and like Valerie said, the, the money runs out. These are problems and they're not going to change unless something changes in the leadership. I'm very cautious about laying out and listening to what people are promising if they haven't been able to deliver up this point or the language changes. We have a lot of money that's about to come in and we need to pour it into addressing housing. We need to provide a pathway to housing that is not convoluted. We need to work on who is prioritized for housing, what those parameters are, and then bring accountability into it and make sure that somebody is doing it because a lot gets lost in the noise. We are going to be asking a, a question specifically about that money that's right. coming okay. from the federal Lovely. government. Um, Kathy Sheehan, your plan to increase the availability of affordable housing? So we have increased the availability of affordable housing throughout my entire term as mayor. Um, we know what works. We partner with uh, community-based organizations, big and small, to ensure that they have the resources that they need in order to build affordable housing. You know, the next big thing that we're looking at is um, emptying, emptying out those outdated towers um, in Lincoln Square. Uh, and we've, we've built uh, hundreds of units of, of affordable housing um, and we want to empty those out and reimagine that amazing space across from Lincoln Park. Um, to again, create a housing that's affordable, but that does allow for uh, home ownership opportunities as well as rental opportunities. We do have to focus on home ownership and we do have to focus on ensuring that we are getting ourselves out of the way, but we also have to bring partners to the table. Um, you know, these are complex issues that involve banks and involve um, bureaucracy that isn't just city bureaucracy, right? It's red tape that the city can help get out of the way. Um, and one of the things that uh, I'm really excited about is uh, we have some great leadership who is really focusing on how we create that black home ownership, how we create and support black owned businesses um, and the leadership that exists in this city around these issues are represented um, on our COVID recovery task force. And I believe that we are gonna knock it out of the park with making sure that we move that forward. Thank you. Um, the Reverend Valerie Faust, what is your plan to increase the availability of quality and affordable housing in the city? Uh, my plan is to help African Americans, low income people get afforded, affordable housing by getting landlords to include apartments in their uh, buildings that uh, we wouldn't, poorer people wouldn't ordinarily afford to be in because there are a lot of building going on, but it's expensive to live in. They're, they're safe, they're beautiful, but certain people cannot get in there. And so that's one of the things I would do. Landlords be required to include uh, apartments for uh, um, uh, underprivileged, or I should say people who are not on the income level that others are. Also- Are you saying that you, you want landlords to include affordable housing in any of their property redevelopment? And so in their property, what I am saying is that if I'm a landlord and I come and I want to buy up a bunch of property and build homes and build uh, uh, apartments, that that landlord should be required to have a certain number of those apartments allotted to uh, under income people. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Also, that they would make it easier for uh, low income people and, and people of color to buy property 
that's out there. There's so much red tape to stop you. I know so many people who went through uh, um, the program of, of getting a house in Albany and there was so much red tape, uh, they, they couldn't get it or someone jumped the line and they got the property. So you have to make it easy for people to get Thank you. Uh, property and, and to uh, be in them. Sure. Um, our next question is many properties in Albany that were once family homes are now rental properties that are not given the maintenance that they once had. Code violations are often obvious. What are you going to do to support building codes? And we'll start with Mayor Kathy Sheehan. Well, we've been part of um, the Cities Rise program and been working with cities across the state to, to deal with this issue. Um, and I'm really proud of the work that we've done. Um, we received the largest grant from the um, Attorney General's office, a million dollars to address blight. We have legislation that's pending right now that is gonna strengthen um, the rights of tenants. It's also gonna strengthen our ability to be more aggressive with landlords to ensure that they maintain their properties. And we also have to be mindful now that we have been through this pandemic and we have a lot of landlords that are hurting. They haven't received uh, any rental payments um, and they want to be able to maintain their property. So as we look at our Recovery Act uh, funding and as we look at what we need to do to ensure that we keep people in their homes, I think we have a really great opportunity to also make sure that we're helping to invest in the maintenance of those properties. Uh, you know, we are uh, incredibly aggressive with respect to citing code violations. Uh, we, you know, but looking around the city right now, you can see the fact that codes court was closed for almost a year. So getting enforcement has been really challenging, but we're ready. Uh, we have a plan in place. We have a cross departmental group that has been working really hard um, over the last two plus years. And uh, landlords need to be on notice that we now have tools in place to ensure that they have to maintain their properties and that if they don't, they're going to pay. Thank you. Alicia Purdy, same question to you. Okay, so um, yes, a building that I stood in front of and made a video a couple of weeks ago was torn down under emergency order after two weeks. So we, I think we know there are ways to get rid of blight here and there if we, if we do need to do that. And I would like to put landlords on notice in the city of Albany that if I'm the mayor, I completely support helping landlords as small business owners build up their business and incentivizing them to do better. We do have a problem in the city of Albany with absentee landlord all over the city of Albany, but we also have wonderful landlords who care about the people of the city of Albany and they are doing all that they can do and they are being punished with new legislation that's going to force them to keep bad tenants. It's going to force them to replace things when the tenant calls for them being a slumlord when they set their carpet on fire. There's, there's, a, there's an uneven handed way of managing landlords versus tenants and there is work that needs to be done there. There are people that have $50,000 in back rent across the capital region that nobody can discover unless they can take this person to court. There's a lot of work to be done there, but, but under the way that I'm going to administrate the city of Albany, one of the things I want to do is treat landowners, good ones and landlords as small business owners and help them build up the city of Albany because there are plenty of people do. And then yes, address the code violations. I just stood in something that looked like a forest on Hunter Avenue recently. There are things that can be done. Somebody can mow their lawn and be incentivized to do that. But part, and it has nothing to do with the pandemic. It really has to do with other fish to fry. But I think everyday livability matters a lot in people's lives. Next question is from an Albany High School student. If you received a, a million dollar grant to use for the city any way you want it, what would you do with it and why? And the reason this question is so such a good question is that um, this gives our viewers an idea of what your priorities are. And Alicia, we're gonna start with you. Okay, so what I'm gonna do first is I'm actually gonna set aside crime. That's something that we're all gonna have to address in a multifaceted manner. And I wanna address the three platforms that I'm running on, transparency, accountability, and livability. So I'm gonna address livability. If I had a million dollars and and crime wasn't an issue, let's just say, I wanna address people's everyday livability. I kind of giggled to myself when I heard the thing about the light bulbs, because I'll tell you what comes up to me all the time, light bulbs, 
potholes, blight, snow removal, and garbage. I interviewed a man the other day that said when he came here from Pakistan, he was so shocked and disappointed to see that Everett Road was filled with panhandlers and garbage. And plenty of people know that it's there. It's, it's like a joke. And so one of the things I would do with that million dollars is I would invest it right back into the city and I would deal with our livability issues. Like I said, we are overrun with these little things that nitpick people to death and it ruins their experience living in the city of Albany. They don't feel comfortable walking on the street because there's no light bulbs. There have, there's exposed wires down on Sherwood. There's one right by my house. I, I mean, this kind of stuff where we, we overlook the everyday, it's because maybe we're not the ones tripping over and falling. And blind people, I just talked the other day, they're having a hard time. There's no batteries in the in the crossing. They see, click, fix, they're doing all these things. A million dollars, easy money would go right back into improving the livability of the residents of Albany who have reported, they've, they've cried out, they've done all these different things. Um, I would let them know, hey, I have a million dollars. Let's tackle the things that you're tripping over, that you're getting electrocuted on, that you're calling about, um, snow removal being another one of them. So uh, I would deal with the everyday livability right off the top of my head. Um, Kathy Sheehan, same question. If you had a million bucks to use any way you wanted, <laughs> what would you do with it? So I would actually turn that back on that high school student. Um, you know, we have wanted to do participatory budgeting in the city of Albany. Um, and, you know, when I came into office, uh, we were basically bankrupt. Uh, the, the state controller made, named us the most fiscally stressed city in the, in the state. Um, but uh, we, we are now at a point, um, even without this million dollars that I'm getting, um, to really start to talk about participatory budgeting. And that means going into the community. And actually, you know, I would split it. I'd do half a million with the high school students asking how they want us to spend the money. And I'd spend half a million on our seniors. We don't talk to our seniors enough about what their needs are in the community. And I would ask them, how do you want us to spend this money? How do you want us to invest? And it gives us the opportunity for them to become civically engaged, understand a little bit more about how city government works, how our budget works, um, and really give them a voice. And I think when people have that voice and that sense of ownership, it does help with uh, across the board, because when you have a sense of ownership of your community and you have a sense of investing in your community, that you're part of how these decisions are made, um, I do believe we take better care of our communities and our neighborhoods, um, whether it's just our block, our street, um, or our park. And so I would use it to do participatory budgeting with our high school students and our seniors. Great. Uh, Valerie Faust, same question. You have a million dollars. What are you going to do with it? Well, I would go back to the student that said, I want to go to the park, but it's not safe. My mom will let me out of the house. So my, I would spend it to, towards uh, crime prevention to uh, make uh, uh, areas safe for children. I would want to spend it on programs but to bring, to combine programs. There's so many different programs for youth, but none of them are really that effective that uh, they could be if they would join forces and become um, uh, collab more collaborative and do things for the youth to train them, to encourage them, to bring in. I would bring in some um, rappers, uh, positive rappers, uh, um, singers, uh, entertainers that would uh, put them on the right road, encourage them instead of the gangster rap and the the, the violent rap and music that they listen to. I bring in positive people, spend the money for them and to uh, get our policemen more interested in working with the youth on, on an everyday basis, mentoring uh, uh, programs for them. So I would spend it on the youth so that, and, and try to uh, along with other monies to, to make life better for them where they're not afraid to go to the park anymore where they're not afraid, their parents aren't living in terror and, and, and making their kids prisoners at home because they fear for their lives. So I would spend, spend every dime of it on youth and, and programs and help to uh, make life better for them. Thank you. So meanwhile, in real life, Albany is expected to uh, receive about $85 million from the American Rescue Plan. What is your plan for that money? And we're gonna to go to Kathy Sheehan first. 
Well, let's start with um, uh, a little bit of a reality check. It's $80.5 million. The, um, the Treasury has now uh, done the allocations across the country, and uh, most cities got a little bit less than what was uh, first calculated in the legislation. But boy, $80.5 million is really transformational funding. And we are going to lead with equity. Not everyone started this pandemic from the same place. And we know that. And that was laid bare as we saw the impacts and the disproportionate impact of this pandemic on communities of color uh, across our city. And so we have to ensure that we are investing this funding and building back better with equity. I'm really uh, looking forward to the work that the COVID Recovery Task Force is doing. They're collecting information for us. There are lots of funding sources out there. We have to make sure that we're good stewards of this funding. Jakeen Hoke, who's an outstanding leader in this community, uh, you know, he's an investor. Uh, he's, uh, you know, investing in housing uh, in the South End, uh, doing a really innovative development there. Um, Mike Whalen, who's, uh, you know, been a resident of the city of Albany, all, all his life and is in banking. Um, and, and then all of the community members who we brought to the table so that we ensure that we understand what the needs are of our families, what the needs are of our small businesses, what the needs are that exist uh, in our community to, uh, to ensure that we deal with the health impacts uh, of, the, of the COVID pandemic. I'm really excited about how transformational this okay. is. So Valerie Faust, um, $80.5 million, still a lot of money. What's 5 million between friends? Um, <laughs> all coming from the federal government. Uh, what is your plan? Well, my plan, commun communication. Bringing the uh, people together uh, because there are wards, different wards, 15 wards. Uh, we all have, every ward has a problem, has an issue, has something that they need, something they've been waiting on, something that has not been changed, uh, uh, something that uh, they're not happy about that they wish the city would come and help. So I, I would definitely bring people to the table. Look, guys, we have this money. We want to use it wisely. We want it to be community to, to to really help the community the various communities and and fill some of the needs we might can't handle all the wants but we can deal with some of the needs that we have in our community and let's spend this money wisely um, and and see what we could do and so I would I would uh, just like to talk to the people because uh, just just being an activist all these years I've found out that a few people have made too many decisions for the many and left the many uh, voice, uh, the many, uh, the the majority voice out of it. So I would like to bring them together because that money can do a lot for housing, for seniors, for the disabled, uh, uh, for uh, the youth, for education. I mean, we could spread it around and not build something uh, not needed that's not going to help uh, um, our people. So yeah, we need to have a community budget meeting. Let the, let's let's do zooms <laughs> about it. Let's let's talk about it and and right. uh, spend it wisely. Thank you, Alicia Purdy. Same question. Okay, so yes, eighty million dollars. Oh boy, get to spend, spend. So let me just tell you this: it translates to roughly five point three six million dollars per ward. So we could start right there. One of my, uh, so I would not go big. Let me just tell you that I would go very, very small. So I'll give you a list. Here's a couple of things I wouldn't do. I wouldn't build a gondola. Wouldn't build a sky bridge. Wouldn't build a high tower. What I would do with that money is I would invest it into communities, specifically small businesses. Like I said earlier, um, police, fire, first responders, infrastructure. I, you know what I would do? I would build up the free press in the city of Albany, Channel Albany. Look what we have. We have um, the city hall is broadcasting from their per their YouTube pages and their Facebook pages where people have to go find them. I would make information freely available and I would really build up the free press. I am diehard against the squelching of the first amendment in the city of Albany. I think it's a huge problem. And I would be very, very careful using the word equity. What people don't understand is that equity is not the same thing as equality. Equality is a protected constitutional right. Equity is an arbitrary definition that's set. Now, this COVID relief panel that we have, if you've looked at the 40 people that are on that list, most of them 
three quarters of them, seven eighths, five, six of them, they are wealthy elites. And I'm extremely concerned about the lack of representation of the people on that board making decisions for me and the $5.3 million my ward should get. And so I am very concerned about that. And it really is very telling of how um, money has been spent and it's not gonna change going forward. So you're definitely gonna want a mayor who knows how to spend money equally under the law. We're gonna move on to a local issue. Um, the Capitol holiday lights in the park has been an issue uh, in the news. Objections have been raised and some people wanna see the event moved from Washington Park this year. Other residents are fully supportive of the event and want it to stay right where it is. I'd love to know what your position is on this matter and we'll start with you, Alicia. Okay. so. The lights, yes, I understand that the lights are a big deal to people. It's a tradition, people people love it. One of the problems with the, the lights, however, is that people have not been very responsible in how they've taken care of our parks. Washington Park is the most used park in the city of Albany. So I'll tell you what I'm not against. I'm not against rethinking where the lights go. I'm not against rethinking how the lights are displayed. I'm not against rethinking the way that we, we, we disseminate, the way that we bring people in and out. Um, if people don't want it in Washington Park, and that's a consensus issue, listen, the, my whole platform about livability matters. It really matters. People's livability experience matters in the city of Albany. If we reach a consensus and we have a majority, I'm happy to put it to a vote where people can say, look, this is our neighborhood or this is our park and we care. I'm not against any of that sort of thing. I think it's a lovely tradition. Could it be done better? Certainly it could be. So should we dismantle it for a season, let the park recover, rethink about it? I'm okay with all of that. Because people's, people that live in those neighborhoods have a problem with the people who care about the environment and the overuse. We have a lot of parks in Albany that could actually be better utilized. Um, I'm concerned about, you know, the cars driving through all the same things that the neighborhood associations and, and people who live there have expressed. I see those things too. And I'm absolutely not against doing something different. I don't think tradition should get in the way of the livability in the city of Albany, especially if we could do better and rethink it that in a way that pays honor to our, our environment, to our, um, and the human beings that live in the city of Albany. Kathy Sheehan, holiday, uh, Capitol holiday lights in the park. It's been an issue. What do you think should be done about it? Well, I've listened to the neighborhood uh, association representatives from all of the neighborhood associations that surround the park. I've listened to the president of the Washington Park Conservancy, um, and they uh, do not want lights in the park. I've also met with Pal, and I have offered to um, facilitate a meeting with Pal. I think one of the things that many of the neighborhood associations were Please responding athletic, to- Please, athletically. Sorry, Pal, what did I say? I'm sorry. Uh, I, no, I, no, I, you said pal, yeah. Oh, okay. I was just saying that it's the police at athletic league for people who don't know. So facilitate a meeting um, with them to talk about what is possible. We have asked right now, what we've asked for is for an electrical engineer to provide us with um, a full report about the electrical infrastructure that has been um, put into Washington Park. We need to understand um, you know, where it is and understand that it, whether it or not is up to code. Um, and we have to, again, uh, look at this 150 year old park, this incredible jewel in the city of Albany, um, designed by Frederick Olmsted. And um, it's a place of respite and relaxation. Um, so we're launching a traffic study. So we're really looking uh, at Washington Park and whether or not this use is still compatible um, with this historic park. It is a fundraiser, Kathy Sheehan, for, that largely benefits the poor. So should it continue uh, somewhere? Well, it's a fundraiser that benefits the Police Athletic League and youth programs in our city, and we need to work with them to find alternatives to fundraising if ultimately it's determined that this will not continue okay. in Washington Park. Valerie Faust, same question. Mm, well, I think that uh, my, I, I tried to find out what was the monetary benefit to the organizations. I couldn't find that information out. Um, because if you're going to take it away and it, it, it has been financially benefiting someone, there has to be something put in place to continue those funds uh, going to those organizations. Now, uh, if, if the majority of the people, as Kathy mentioned, want it out of there, then, you know, what do you, what do you, what are you going to do? 
what are you going to do? So I think that it's a beautiful thing, but when, and many people benefit from it, but you know what? It's, we need something. And that's why it's so important at Christmas time, because Albany has not, doesn't have too much else at, at Christmas time for people to do it within the city. So it, it's been a hit for a lot of little children. So we have to be careful to see if we're going to move it somewhere else, do it smaller, are we going to compensate the finances to these organizations so not to leave them hanging? And so I think it, it's some more discussion is needed. I think that some more planning uh, of, of what do we do afterwards if it does close. And so that um, it's, it's a fair deal to uh, everyone involved. Thank you. Our next question is about Pride Month. Um, the month of June is Pride Month in the city of Albany. Pride Month is the promotion of the self-affirmation, dignity, equality, and increased visibility of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people as a social group. How will you ensure that the LGBTQ members of the community are treated with equality and fairness as mayor? And we're gonna start with you, Kathy Sheehan. So we raised the pride flag uh, at City Hall today, and uh, we work really closely with pride as well as within our own voices to ensure that um, they have the resources that they need. Unfortunately, Pride Festival is not happening uh, in June as it normally would. Um, again, that you know, that's another incredible use of Washington Park. Um, where the city provides a facility, but uh, pride and, and in our own voices um, run an incredible festival. Um, you know, we work really closely with the LGBTQ community, whether it be with concerns that they have about safety issues or with, um, you know, suggestions that they have around creating pride in our city. Um, as anybody who is uh, driven down Central Avenue knows, we have a rainbow crosswalk uh, on Central Avenue that was requested uh, by members of the LGBTQ community. Um, and it was something that is, is, is so celebrated. People want to be seen. Um, they want to be seen for who they are and for their humanity. And I think that's one of the things that um, we can often lose sight of um, in a bureaucracy. But you know, when you focus on ensuring that you are seeing people, that you are uh, um, ensuring that you are creating an environment where everyone is welcome, where everyone is safe, um, that that is how you build community. And I look at all of the things that our LGBTQ community do for the city of Albany, and it's reflected in the fact that they're proud of the place where they live. Thank you. Um, Valerie Faust, uh, how will you ensure that this, uh, the LGBTQ community uh, is treated with equality and fairness if you're mayor? Well, the, the, the very word community, they're a part of our community. And it, it's a shame that we have to uh, give them a, a, a section in it and people look at the people prejudices and people's opinion that may be negative towards them. Um, I'm all for it, treating all people right. They are people. And so um, my heart about it is include help support, which I've done over the years. I've worked with many communities, uh, LGBTQ communities over the years. I have, I've even worked with In Our Own Voices when they were starting up many years ago. Um, so I've been working it, with that community for years. So de definitely I would de include them, uh, support them, also uh, have them at the table as well. And, and the fact that I have to say them is just uncomfortable, you know, uh, but I guess that's the only way you can, you, you can uh, put it because that's the way our society have it. But yes, to have that uh, community at the table, listen to them in our own voices. And so uh, that says a lot right there. So yeah, yeah, they are part of our community, you know, so they, they're, they're included. In, in that diversity, in that equity and, and equality and inclusion. Thank you. Uh, finally, to Alicia Purdy, how will you ensure the LGBTQ community is treated with equality and fairness if you're mayor? 
So one of the things I want to make really clear is that a core tenet, a fundamental tenet of who I am as a person is that all life has value. And my core tenet for me as an American is that we have the freedom to express however we want to live, uh, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I believe in that as a fundamental right for all citizens of the United States of America. So let me just put that out there. Second of all, do you know what the LGBT community wants more than anything else? They, uh, how about what they don't want? They don't want to get shot in the face. And so one of the things that I really appreciate appreciate about what I hear from the LGBT community. They love a, a good flag, no problem. They love a great sidewalk. What they want is they want light bulbs when they're walking downtown. I met a gay man who had said to me, reached out and said, one of the biggest problems I have is that I'm terrified to walk down the street because I'm gay, but, and also the street is dark. And so he said, if you could just put a light bulb down there, I would feel a lot less marginalized as a gay man. And so, you know, we, we, we don't want to major in the minors. Of course, they deserve representation. They deserve all the equality the Constitution affords them. But what really affects their everyday living in the city of Albany is livability transparency and accountability and what they're, they're struggling with everything else and being gay that, that that's part of their nature that that's secondary to them to being a human being and they deserve to live and express themselves and comprise their family however they want to comprise it and my job as mayor is to protect them as human beings and make sure that they can live in peace they can live in security and safety that they have their rights afforded to them under the constitution i'm here to defend that for them and make sure that they are not subject to discrimination on any level those are the things that matter we're going to move on um at a recent neighborhood association meeting it was shared that the landfill that Albany uses is predicted to be full uh, and closed by 2025 or 26. Uh, additionally, plastic production continues to increase, but much of it ends up in our landfills instead of being recycled. How will you prepare Albany to handle these issues? And we're gonna start with Valerie Faust. Well, again, um, as mayor, you would have to because I'm not the mayor yet, uh, um, and I put it that way, excuse me, but uh, we would have to find out what the problem is and, and, and look ahead to see how we're, what are we going to do when it's full, not waiting until it is full, but coming up with some viable ideas about what are we going to do uh, um, in, in the years that uh, before it gets critical looking for other alternatives, looking for other places that uh, could work with us to get rid of our, um, our refuge. And so, yeah, just sit down and talk about it and find a place uh, that we can go uh, at before the problem is before the problem is worse. You know, because a lot of times we are uh, um, reactive instead of proactive. We sit around and we're making these plans and whatnot. And then bam, we're, we're in the of uh, the crux of the, the problem. So yeah, to sit down and figure out ahead of time, what are we gonna do? Where's this garbage gonna go? Where, who are we gonna get? Where are the people that we can uh, call to help us with this problem? And it costs money too. You have to have, have talk about the finances of all of this and, and really discuss it and, and come, come up with good ideas of how to solve this problem. Thank you. Alicia Purdy. Um... The Albany landfill is going to be full in 2025 or 26. What are you going to do about it? Oh, it might be full as soon as 2023, I'm, I'm hearing on the ground. So yes, this is a big problem. One of the major things that, and I, I know that I know that City Hall has, has started this initiative, and I think it should be bolstered maybe with that $1 million or the 80 that we have. Um, <laughs> I, I think what we need to do, honestly, is we need to, first of all, we need to double down on things like recycling. We actually have initiatives in the City of Albany that are repurposing materials and doing great things. You could put plastic in asphalt. There's all kinds of things that you can do um, with recyclable materials. But, you know, just if you remember our parents' generation, they, they were just throwing garbage indiscriminately on the ground, and it really is a mindset that can take generations of education and repetition um, to continue. So we, we've got to continue that. But there are programs Let's give them greater exposure. Let's get them into schools right now while kids are little to start these initiatives um, to raise up a generation that is mindful of garbage. So, okay, Rap Road's getting full. What do we do? Let's work with um, engineers. There are actually other cities and municipalities that are getting it right. Not everybody has a massive overwhelming problem with garbage. Um, there are places that we could 
um, there are ideas or innovators that are coming in with ways to repurpose it, things mm -hmm. that you can do with this when it's there. Um, other land that's available, dealing with other municipalities who maybe we have some kind of land share agreement. There are actually a lot of options. And one of the things I've noticed um, as, I've, as I've lived in the city of Albany, it always seems like we don't have a lot of options. Well, we actually do have a lot of options and we have to make better employ of the options that we have and, and work with subject matter experts. Thank you. Um, Kathy Sheehan, uh, what do you think should be done with the landfill? Well, when I became city treasurer, we were facing the triple threat. The city relied on the landfill to balance its budget. It was borrowing well beyond the useful life of the landfill. And it did not have, uh, it was not charging what it actually cost to uh, dump garbage in the landfill. So one of the most unpopular things that I did was when we issued bonds for the expansion of the landfill, I matched those bonds to when the landfill was slated to close, which at that time was 2020. And then when I became mayor, I started to wean us off of the revenue from the landfill so that we weren't using it as an ATM. And I also looked to how we could reduce, by reducing our, our financial dependence on it, it reduced the amount of garbage that we were taking into the landfill. And so we were able to expand the life to 2023, then 2025, and now 2026. And so now the landfill is paid off. That's created $5.2 million of additional money in our operating budget. We no longer rely on the landfill for our budget because the revenue that we get covers the cost of operating the landfill. And we're looking over the next five years to actually continue to reduce our dependence on the landfill. We now get top dollar uh, in tipping fees for what's going into the landfill. And as we planned for that future, um, we actually had to put our plans on hold because we did such a good job of extending the life of the landfill, but we'll be ready when it closes. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to another green issue. Albany has the opportunity, excuse me, to go more green. Um, what initiatives do you intend to pursue so that Albany not only continues to be able to handle the waste it produces, but also does so in a more environmentally conscious way? Each of you has sort of touched on this, but Alicia Purdy, um, take it from here. All right. So I am a really big fan of sustainability. And I love that we have um, things throughout the city. Like I said, there are people whose passion is already being put to use in these areas, but there's such a tiny scale. And so I would love to see things like um, gardens that feed themselves. And I would love to see things like, hey, but how about something easy? How about a water bottle, a station where all around the city where you can fill up instead of water fountains or whatever, you can fill up a reusable bottle. How about incentives to get people to do things where um, they can live a greener life? Maybe we do something where we have a, you know, we, we got rid of our plastic bags and maybe they're kind of creeping back into our society again because of the pandemic or whatever, um, where we incent, I'm, I'm okay with incentivizing people and saying, look, these are important issues in your neighborhood, right at your front door. One of my neighborhood by neighborhood initiatives I'll be talking about in the future is helping people invest in what's right in front of them, right in front of their stoop, right in front of their sidewalk, and teaching people the value of working towards something that, that beautifies their, their neighborhoods, beautify, and then thereby um, grows outward and beautifies the city. But a lot of that has to do with creating a sustainable culture that can, that can feed into itself. I'm really big on reinvesting back into the city of Albany. Mm -hmm. And whether that be, um, we need to have uh, more community gardens would be something really investing in that, not, not just a little person who's doing it, but really a, a citywide initiative where we have things that can help us take some of the burden off and create a sustainability that we can build upon. Kathy Sheehan, what initiatives do you intend to pursue so that Albany not only continues to be able to handle the waste it produces, but also does so in a more environmentally conscious way? Well, this is an area where we just continue to innovate and innovate. You know, we've created green infrastructure to deal with the impacts of climate change. We've also made sure that we uh, have invested 
in uh, LED streetlights. We're investing in EV chargers across the city. Uh, we are also, you know, planting 2,025 trees by 2025. And the other thing that we need to do is we've got to ensure that we're connecting our community with the jobs that are being created by the green economy. And that's something that we've already started. We have the wind project, the wind tower project that's happening down at the port, really ensuring that we become part of the growing economy around uh, making sure that we are addressing uh, our impacts on the environment. You know, we've also initiated a, a, a composting program. It's a pilot uh, that we've launched that we look forward to growing in the city of Albany. And it's one of the reasons that I'm really uh, proud of the fact that I have been endorsed by the New York League of Conservation Voters. You know, as you look at what we have done, whether it is uh, selling carbon credits um, uh, in the, for the forests that were, are being managed and will now be forever managed around our incredible uh, Alcove Reservoir to really looking uh, at our own infrastructure and how we can build on uh, alternative energy opportunities here in the city of Albany uh, to looking at community choice aggregation um, to purchase power for everyone in our city that is renewable. Thank you. Uh, Valerie Faust, same question to you. Okay, um, I would definitely um, get people to recycle, to, to seriously recycle, because I have found out that that is not really being pushed and people are not really using the recycle build uh, uh, bins. Also, I think electricity, uh, how we use electricity in, uh, the in our buildings um, and on our property and our city streets, um, the farming, we, I know a group of people who are doing farming uh, down in the inner city, the gardening, and they are talking about not getting support and not getting, they're using their own money. It's a group of about 20 young people down there doing gardening on their own, not only uh, doing the gardening, but teaching the inner city, inner city uh, people how to do gardening and to go take their uh, crops to the market. And so I think that uh, cuts down on a lot of things. Then you talk about the air quality uh, over in certain neighborhoods that we uh, can do something about and get with the uh, state to help us with the air quality that comes from down near the port, down near, uh, and um, I forget the name of the neighborhood where we had the huge protests because of the quality of air. So we, there's a lot that sure, we can do. Yes, yes. So it's, it's a lot that we can do uh, to uh, become more green. And it's gonna take our citizens to have a mindset change that uh, to care about the environment and, uh, and all yeah. the trees that's just been cut down, like, okay, uh, can, can we duplicate, bring Thank them you. back? Uh, this question is from an Albany High School student. During this time of the pandemic, will there ever have to be a mandatory COVID-19 vaccine? Kathy Sheehan, we'll start with you. Well, that's above the pay grade of mayor, but uh, I appreciate the, the question. And, you know, I think it's important to note that the vaccine that the vaccines that are available received emergency authorization. And so that what that means is that they are authorized to be used, but um, there are issues around mandating that vaccine. They are seeking to get approved. And so just like, um, you know, the measles vaccine can be required in order for our kids to go to school, the COVID-19 vaccine could become mandatory if it receives that, that type of approval. So that's not something that mayors actually um, have control over. One of the things that mayors do um, have uh, the ability to do though is to encourage people to get vaccinated. It's safe, um, it's effective, and it, it is now uh, approved for anyone over the age of 12. And as we see people get vaccinated, as we try to get back to normal and take these masks off, it's really important that we come together as a community, that we use science, that we use facts, uh, that we engage in um, really ensuring that we're talking to the experts so that we can make the uh, informed decisions about what we do going forward. Um, because as we know, this pandemic has been devastating on our community, on our economy, um, on our children's ability to be with one another 
um, and the social emotional challenges that has created because our schools had to be closed. All right, um, I'm going to sort of twist this question a little bit because it's not really a, a mayoral issue, but Valerie Faust, um, if, if the vaccine were to be mandatory for to go to public school, would you support that? I'm not sure. Mandatory is one of those words that uh, kind of uh, make me a little nervous because it, to me, it sounds like you're taking away rights. You're taking away choice. And so um, am I against mandatory? I think so to an extent because people should have a right to make choices, especially um, under the I should say the cloud of people really, really understanding what this these uh, vaccines are about. And so I think some people need a little bit more time, but it's it's their right to choose to take it and it's their right to choose not to take it. But as many people who decide to take it, then don't, don't because it's becoming us against them type of thing. Um, oh, I got mine, did you get yours? Oh, no, you didn't get yours. Or you say, um, oh yeah, I got mine. They say, no, you didn't take that shot. And so we have to come together on it, but mandatory, I'm not too sure about that uh, right now. All right. Um, so uh, Alicia Purdy, uh, during this time of the pandemic, will there ever have to be a mandatory COVID-19 vaccine? So I'm gonna give you the same answer, not really a mayoral issue. However, let me just say this. I do remember a time in history where a people group um, was forced to turn over their papers and have them examined and register with the government. We wanna be very careful about government oversight and medical authoritarianism. Um, and so would I encourage someone to get the vaccine? You know what I'd encourage people to do? I would encourage people to think for themselves and to make up their own minds based on their health, but their healthcare provider. I would never personally encourage somebody to inject something that was not even FDA approved. That's a major concern for me. And so, but again, I am a firm believer that what you decide to do with your body and what you decide to inject in it, that isn't going to, um, you know, be an illegal street drug or something like that, that's clearly against the law. Um, whatever you decide to do with your body is between you, yourself, and your, you, you yourself and you, and your medical provider. Because you know what? They know you better than I do. I can't encourage you to take something that, that now, because I said it, maybe you do take it and you do have a, a side effect that affects you for the rest of your life. So no, I don't encourage people to take something. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a snake oil salesman. What I encourage people to do is to think for themselves and to make up their own minds. And they have the freedom to do that under the law. So um, if it were mandated- What about vaccines like- measles and things like that um you know the measles and mumps rubella vaccine do you support taking those well, that, that ship is sailed i mean it's something that you have to have in order to attend public school in the city of albany and i'm i'm not going to die in the hill of trying to strip that right away from people no that in, in the city of albany that's how it is and my kids attend public schools and we're all good <laughs> um have all of the candidates been vaccinated I personally do not discuss any of my medical history with anybody as a policy pre-COVID. I'm vaccinated and it was a great feeling and my son's vaccinated and my husband's vaccinated and it's a huge relief. How about you, Valerie Faust? I am not vaccinated and um, I don't know when I will get vaccinated because I have underlying uh, uh, medical issues. Next question, we're gonna start with Alicia Purdy. Do you support term limits for the office you are seeking? If yes, why? And how many terms are appropriate? If no, please explain. Yes. As someone running for mayor, I do absolutely support term limits um, in any office of government, I would like to add, um, because I believe that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And what we don't want, we don't want an oligarchy. We don't want a monarchy. We don't want somebody who's in, in an entrenched leader for so many years that they lose sight of the people. That's what happens. That's what happened in the French Revolution. We're all down here. We hear, oh, let them eat cake. And, and we're down here as citizens who are actually struggling and toiling. And what happens? You become you become um, fat on the taxes of the people. And I'm absolutely in support of term limits. Okay, so let's talk about mayor. I, I'll, I'll take it off the national scale. In terms of mayor, um, so a term limit, let's say, so an eight-year term limit, I'm not opposed to a three-term limit. 
I'm not opposed to something like that because I will say in all honesty, regardless of who Ever the mayor is, um, it sometimes does take a long time to get things to turn around. That I think it's fair to say that. I think it's fair that, especially if you have an opposing common council, you've got other things going on. Um, it does take time. It takes time to change people's hearts. It takes time to, to build things and to finance things. So um, yeah, I think it's I think it's not unfair to say. It's certainly, we know in the city of Albany, we've had a number of legacy mayors, and um, I don't think history has been kind to them. And I think it's important that we understand. Um, that after a while you take a step away and let a fresh set of eyes um, take over and bring a new perspective to something because um, after a while, I think you start to lose sight of the forest for the trees. Kathy Sheehan, term limits. Well, I'm on record as supporting term limits. I'm on record as supporting uh, two term term limits. Um, and I will say that, you know, I think going into 2020, um, you know, we expected a very different year. We were on a sound fiscal path. We had created a lot of really great change in the city of Albany. And we had really put um, um, our, ourselves on a path to, um, to success. And, and then everything stopped. And I think that the other thing that happened in 2020 is that it really, um, because of all of the challenges that we faced, because the first things that we had to do was figure out how do we support our families? How do we feed them? How do we, uh, how do we support our businesses? How do we prevent them from going out of business? What do we need to be doing as a government? It all showed how important experience was. And I think as we come out of this pandemic, experience matters, relationships matter. The relationships that I've built, not only um, you know, here in the city of Albany, but with the other mayors here in the region, the leadership that I demonstrated um, representing this region as a mayor uh, with the state level advocating for what our community wanted, our businesses wanted and needed during this pandemic. And then also representing us uh, on a national level with the US Conference of Mayors being instrumental in helping to get the Recovery Act passed um, and in, in advocating for our community. And so I think that that experience matters and that's why I'm running for a third term. Is that it for you though? Is your th third term, if you win, will that be your it? I, I, yeah, I, I, I agree with what Alicia said. Um, you know, we have a long history in the city of Albany. Um, I'm, you know, I'm only, people say it's a big deal that I'm a woman mayor, but I'm only the fourth mayor in 79 years. So I think it yeah. is important to have changes in leadership and to ensure that I'm doing all that I can to make room for those other leaders. And I believe that I've done that with many of our other citywide elected officials, as well as our common council members who do, are doing outstanding work. We can't hear you, Susan. You Valerie go. Faust, um, do you support term limits for the office you're seeking? Uh, yes, yes, I do uh, support term limits um, because as uh, Alicia said, people, people get jaded, people get comfortable. Like uh, the mayor was saying, she's built alliances, she's gotten friends. And as someone told me uh, when I, uh, came in to run, oh, you're not going to beat her because she's the incumbent and we don't have a history of the incumbent uh, being taken out of office. And that's a part of, of the need for term limits because um, people are not going to be true to what we really need as uh, some people are not going to be true to what we need for change. And we need a change now. We need, we need I think uh, our mayor may have reached her her uh, uh, limit uh, as far as coming up with new ideas, fresh ideas, uh, knowing how to treat people, uh, being more of a people person and more of a community uh, mayor. I think, I and, and that's why we're running and that's why there is this because I believe that if she was doing a great job as she sounds like she's doing, I wouldn't run. I'm, I'm, I'm running because I think there's a need to run. There's a need for change. So uh, yeah, I support term limits and, um, definitely, even if, uh, if I were in the seat, that, that it would be unnecessary. Thank you. All right. So now we're going to do uh, one minute each, starting with you, Valerie, uh, for closing remarks. Okay. Um, my purpose for running is to bring about change. I believe that the city needs a change. I, I believe that it needs to go 
that needs to go forward. I believe that um, with all that we've been through that we need someone to restore the, the vitality, the morality. Um, it's gonna, we're gonna need some healing because uh, if, if, if I were blessed to win, then we're, I'm coming into a post, a post uh, uh, pandemic uh, era. And sorry, I was cut off. Um, um, we're coming into a post-demic area. So we, we really have to uh, um, heal. We have to really get to the drawing board to see how we're gonna go forward. We um, really need to get the people involved. So I want to uh, bring the city together. I want to lift up. I want to, the various department heads because being a mayor is, is, is a big job. It's a big job. You have to build relationships. Thank you. you have to deal with, with everyone. Thank you, Reverend Faust. Kathy Sheehan, one minute. Thank you. And I want to use this minute to thank the unbelievable workforce that we have here in the city of Albany. This has been an unprecedented year. And while other institutions closed down, our employees stepped up. They went to work. They uh, continued to keep us safe. They picked up the garbage. They did all that they could uh, to try to keep our parks clean. And then when we were faced with uh, financial uh, challenges, unlike anything that we had ever seen before, um, you know, we fought through it. We had a summer youth employment program when most other cities across the country did not. We opened our pools, we opened our parks, we had programs. And that happened because of the dedicated workers here in the city of Albany who have just done an outstanding job during these unprecedented times. I'm grateful for them. No leader does it alone. Leaders do things well when they surround themselves with really great leaders, with people who uh, have a passion for the work that they're doing, and they give them the space and the resources to do it. Thank you. And Alicia Purdy, one minute. Okay, so I'm running on the platform of the people's mayor. My three prongs are livability, accountability, and transparency. And we've heard, you know, throughout the evening that, that this is obviously working. I disagree. It's obviously not working. Um, the leadership in Albany has struggled with being a little bit toned up and out of touch. In fact, probably a lot. And so, um, yeah, we definitely had an unprecedented area, but just one year. And so we've had lots of other years that weren't unprecedented um, that we've, we've struggled. And so what I think the city of Albany absolutely needs is a gritty leader who's unafraid, who's, in, who's experienced in what they're doing, who knows what they're talking about, who has a genuine concern about people and knows how to manage a city of people, not a city filled with policies. And so um, that my campaign is called, I'm called the people's mayor for that reason. I really wanna empower the people of Albany to live the life that they see fit for themselves and come alongside them and support doing those kind of things. And so um, when we talk about how we're going to approach, you know, city government and change and new seasons, what you need is a new mayor. And so um, stepping up to do just that and appreciate everybody's time this evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you. Real quickly, um, this year, the primary for those parties that are holding primaries is uh, June 22nd. Early voting starts on June 12th and goes through June 20th. And uh, absentee ballots are available for those who are unable to go to the polls on election day. You have to apply, though, to the Board of Elections to receive an absentee ballot, which will be mailed to your street address. You then fill out the ballot, mail it back to the Albany County Board of Elections. The deadline to apply for an early ballot is June 15th, and June 21st is the last day to apply for an absentee ballot in person. Thank you very much to the NAACP, you, the League of Women Voters, and CANA. We are done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Night. Thanks, Good Alicia. Night. Thanks, Val. Thanks, Appreciate everybody. it. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks, Susan. Oh, Thank you. Okay. Yeah. No, she said we're done. Oh. Um, uh, maybe because of the time? Oh, yeah, eight o'clock. Okay. Well, it's okay. All right. Well, mm -hmm. okay. bye. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Oh. Thank you. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. Okay. Hey, all right. Is it the recording stopped? Has the recording stopped? No. Stop?